In one of the last letters Paul ever wrote, he prophesied, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Paul was certain that perilous times would come in the last days, and he told Timothy that he could be absolutely sure of it. But those perilous times would not be dangerous and difficult to bear because they involved earthquakes, famines, hurricanes, diseases, or natural disasters. They would be dangerous and difficult to bear because they involve deep-seated and unrepentant sin in the hearts of many seemingly pious people. In fact, as Paul continued writing to Timothy, he quickly summarized his earlier prophecy several verses later by saying, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And a more literal and understandable way to translate Paul's warning would be, evil people and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So Paul labeled the people who fit the description of his frightening prophecy, evil people and impostors. Plus, he said that they would grow worse and worse deceiving others while actually being deceived themselves. And the listed characteristics of those that Paul called evil people and impostors are important for us to study, since those characteristics can help us learn if we are in the perilous times of the last days. Plus, as we study them, and recognize them as disqualifying sins, we can make sure that we never allow these wicked attributes to infect our thinking and lead us astray from the way of righteousness. And the first wicked identifying feature of evil people and imposters is that many of them are lovers of themselves. But this doesn't just mean that they post their vain selfies all over Facebook because Thayer's Greek lexicon explains that the Greek word philautos also speaks of a person who is too intent on one's interest or selfish. And the dictionary definition of selfish is lacking consideration for others or concerned chiefly with one's own personal profit or pleasure. So we must be very careful never to fall into a place where we could be described with the Greek word, philautos. Instead, we must obey the biblical command that says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And when we obey that command, we will be willing to give others gifts from the resources God has entrusted to us, such as our time, talents, treasure, tongue, and touch. We'll give of our time by patiently waiting for our brothers and sisters without grumbling, or perhaps by visiting them in their troubles. We'll give of our talents by providing sound advice on subjects we have experience in when our brothers and sisters request it, 
or even by lending a helping hand when our God-given skills allow us to. We'll give of our so-called treasure by cheerfully sharing our earthly goods and our earthly wealth with our brothers and sisters who are facing hard times. We'll give of our tongue by thanking, encouraging, and praising our brothers and sisters for their faithful service to the Lord and his children. And we will give of the resource of touch by laying hands on and praying for our brothers and sisters, or even by sharing a hug or an encouraging pat on the shoulder. This is how we show real love for our brothers and sisters in the Lord and look out for their interests with the same concern we show for our own. But because every true follower of the Messiah loves their Lord and his people more than they love earthly wealth, no true follower of Jesus could ever be called a lover of money. In fact, Paul uses the noun form of that same Greek adjective when he wrote in his first letter to Timothy, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And please make no mistake, the phrases, the love of money, and the desire to be rich are speaking about the same thing. Plus, the Greek word Paul used that we translate as rich simply means to have abundance, in this case, of earthly possessions. So, the desire to obtain or keep an abundance of earthly possessions is the root of all kinds of evil. And it causes many to stray from the faith because it is a snare or trap that the devil uses to try to destroy us. This is why Jesus told the ruler who had many earthly possessions, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And it is also why Jesus then said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Please don't allow anyone to deceive you by claiming that there might be some way to theoretically get a camel through the non-literal eye of a needle. Because just after Jesus said this, Scripture records, when his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? Prior to the Messiah's teachings, most people believed that God gave riches to the most righteous people because in the pre-Messianic scriptures, earthly prosperity was used to foreshadow eternal prosperity, just as an earthly promised land was used to foreshadow an eternal promised land. So the disciples were astonished because the words of Jesus indicated that the rich had less of a chance of inheriting the kingdom of God than a camel had of passing through the literal eye of a literal needle. Which is why Jesus said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. And that's also why Peter responded by saying, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? And in no uncertain terms, Jesus answered, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left houses 
or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life Peter understood that Jesus was clearly teaching that his true followers were never to seek after or have an overabundance of earthly possessions. And Jesus promised that those who left behind their families and their earthly possessions in order to follow him would receive a larger spiritual family who would welcome them into their earthly homes in this life. Plus, they would receive eternal life when their mortal journey on earth ended. And these same teachings of Jesus caused a wealthy tax collector named Zacchaeus to declare, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Then our Lord immediately responded by saying, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. Now, the words of Jesus to Zacchaeus should immediately remind us of the words of John the Baptist, who said, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? And he answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise the soldiers asked him, saying, and what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone, or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. Looking at these passages, it is clear that Jesus only declared that Zacchaeus received salvation as a son of Abraham when he repented and produced fruits worthy of repentance. And that is the only way a rich man will enter the kingdom of heaven. So only when our Lord heard a rich tax collector decide to give half of his goods to the poor and restore fourfold any money he collected improperly did he declare salvation had visited his house. And the Lord and his apostles were very consistent when they spoke on the subject of earthly riches because Jesus also said, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Plus, he spoke about the rich man that had a beggar named Lazarus who sat at his gate seeking crumbs from the rich man's table, saying, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And Jesus reported, that Abraham said to that rich man who was in torment in the flames of Hades, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. Jesus also gave an account of a rich man who decided to build bigger barns to house all of his earthly possessions while he retired, ate, drank, and made merry. 
And the Messiah said that God rebuked that man by asking, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then, whose will these things be which you have provided? So, while there's not a single post-Messianic passage that speaks positively about earthly wealth, James unambiguously warns, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. Because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. And James added, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. And for all these reasons, Paul told Timothy, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to put their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but in the living God, who provides all things richly for us to enjoy. To do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and sharing storing up for yourselves a good foundation for the future that they may lay hold of eternal life. And Paul's goal in commanding the rich to share can be seen in Acts as well as in 2 Corinthians where he wrote, For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but an equality that now, at this time, your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. You see, Paul desired to see the Acts-like church continue on indefinitely, just as Luke described when he said, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. But those who are lovers of self or lovers of money will never obey these teachings of Jesus in faith, hope, and love. Instead, they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And sadly, they will find plenty of compromised false teachers out there these days who will tickle their ears and convince them that they can keep on being lovers of self and lovers of money, while still claiming to be followers of Jesus, who will inherit the kingdom of God. And while they're at it, they'll also allow those same false teachers to convince them that they can live as boasters, or more literally, empty pretenders. And the literal meaning of this word shows us why Paul called these folks imposters. Also, because Paul called these individuals empty pretenders and imposters, plus 
because he said that they had a form of godliness or piety while denying or rejecting its power to set them free from sin. We can be certain that this passage is describing people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Like Ananias and Sapphira, or even the scribes and the Pharisees, all their works they do to be seen by men. But God sees right through their act, and he will eventually expose them, just as he exposed and judged Ananias and Sapphira. And next, Paul added that some of these evil people and imposters will be proud. And the word Paul used in the Greek indicates a person who exalts themselves above others, or someone who looks down on others while treating them with contempt. And one common trait all proud people have in common is that they are unsubmissive to God and his appointed authorities. Pride caused Miriam and Aaron to say to Moses, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? Pride caused Korah to say to Moses and Aaron, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? And pride caused Satan to say to himself, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So because pride always leads a person to think too highly of themselves, it also causes people to be discontent in the position God has placed them in. And in their pride and discontentment, oftentimes they will try to rise up against those God has placed over them. Thus, being puffed up with pride, they fall into the same condemnation as the devil. But pride also directs evil people and imposters into Paul's next listed classification of sinner, which was blasphemers. And this Greek adjective literally means speaking evil, slanderous, reproachful, railing, or abusive. Plus it comes from two separate Greek words that mean to hurt or injure another person's name or reputation. However, blasphemy always involves bearing false witness against someone by mischaracterizing their intentions, character, words, or actions. And Peter used the same Greek word Paul used, along with a slightly different conjugation of it, when he wrote, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries whereas angels, who are greater in power and might, do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. You see, pride typically leads a person into a place where they naturally despise authority, and then it eventually leads them into reviling, slandering, and blaspheming those authorities too. But we must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and accept whatever role he has sovereignly placed us in in this life. And if we do this, we will be exalted in due time when our heavenly king returns. Now the next sin on Paul's prophetic list might seem out of place if we had not already seen the terrible effects of pride on the heart of a person. But because we have 
properly laid a solid biblical foundation already regarding how pride typically manifests itself, we can more easily understand why Paul next listed that they are disobedient to parents. Please consider what form of rebellion most clearly reveals that a person is a proud, insubordinate person? I would say rebellion against one's parents. And I would say this because children are not truly capable of caring for themselves, so they are naturally indebted to their parents as the means God used to bring them into the world. Plus, they're commanded to honor and obey their parents in the Holy Decalogue, written by the very finger of God himself. Thus, if a helpless child who actively depends on their parents for food, clothing, and shelter cannot obey the fifth commandment of the creator of the universe and submit to their parents, who they can see and touch, they won't ever truly submit to anyone. Instead, in their pride, they will only ever partially submit to any of God's appointed authorities, and they will openly revolt any time those appointed authorities challenge their carnal mind with the solid food of the Word of God. So while a humble person would gratefully recognize all that their parents had done for them and appropriately respond by honoring their mother and father, a proud and unsubmissive son or daughter would fit with Paul's next description as someone who was unthankful. Obviously, only an unthankful child would ever cast aside all of the gratitude that they should have in their hearts for the years of sacrifice, the countless meals, the love, and the generous kindness of their mother and father, and actively disobey their own parents given to them by God. And those same unthankful people will follow this same pattern in all of their future relationships whenever things get too difficult or any real authority is exercised over them. Perhaps it is because we are in these prophesied perilous times that we see divorce statistics skyrocketing even in the church. And maybe sins like pride, selfishness, the love of money, and the rest of Paul's list in this passage are the root cause behind why so many covenant relationships are being destroyed so flippantly all around us. Either way, the truth is that if we fall into any of these categories of sin, we will most definitely be classified as unholy because that word simply means wicked or unrighteous. And if we're practicing these sins, we will also be labeled by Paul as unloving. But this word doesn't just simply mean that we're not properly loving others as we are commanded in Scripture to love. Instead, it means without natural affection. The fact is that even unbelieving children have natural affection for their parents, and even unbelieving spouses have natural affection for their spouses. But in a world ruled by selfishness, pride, boasting, the love of money, and every other sin, even natural affection is lost in that deeply sickened society. Now, in our English translation, Paul's next listed attribute of the evil person was that they would be unforgiving. But that word more literally speaks of a person who is without a treaty or covenant, or one that cannot be persuaded to enter into a covenant. So even though these imposters might superficially enter into a covenant with their spouse or someone else, they will eventually break that covenant as if it did not exist, because they lacked basic things like sincere gratitude, and natural affection, just as Paul said earlier. But even after they recklessly abandoned their covenant commitments, just forsaking their covenant partner wasn't enough. Instead, at that point, to protect their pride, 
then they have to justify themselves by slandering or falsely accusing their former covenant partner. And this is why divorce is often such a bitter and vindictive process because either one or both parties are trying to shift the blame onto the other party to alleviate their own guilt and protect their selfish pride. And because these individuals are governed by sins like pride, selfishness, and a love of money, they are without self-control. However, those with self-control know how to properly govern their tongues, their bodies, their emotions, their actions, and their thoughts in the power that the Holy Spirit supplies. Plus, those without self-control can be classified as brutal, or more literally, untamed, savage, or fierce. And instead of letting Scripture govern their actions, they let their passions and emotions guide them into more and more savage attacks against their enemies. But sadly, Paul explains that they will treat righteous people as their enemies. Because the word translated here as despisers of good literally means despiser or hater of those that are good. Also, Paul then called them traitors because they turn against and betray those closest to them when their sins are contradicted or exposed. Plus, Paul labeled them as headstrong or more literally rash or reckless because they act without considering the eternal consequences of their decisions. And then Paul explained why they were so reckless when he used a word that can mean to blind with pride or conceit, to render foolish or stupid. You see the word here translated as haughty literally means to wrap in a mist, smoke, or cloud. And metaphorically, Pride, when allowed to exist for a long enough period of time, will literally blind a person and render them incapable of understanding the world as it really is. But this is why we are commanded to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And if we search God's word for answers, instead of interpreting the world through our own passions, perceptions, and faults, God will clear the fog away and give us concrete, quotable verses to stand on that will never let us stumble. But evil men and impostors will not heed the full counsel of the word of God. They will pick and choose the verses that they prefer to fashion for themselves a God in their own image who winks at selfishness, the love of money, pride, and every other sin. And in their pride, they blind themselves to the truth and make themselves twofold the child of hell. But they do all these things for one simple reason. And Paul lists that reason by saying that they are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Did you notice that this entire list began and ended with misplaced love? Anyone who pursues the love of self, the love of money, and the love of pleasure cannot pursue the love of God. This is why Paul warned, the one who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. And that's why Jesus said, the ones that fell among thorns are those who when they have heard go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. 
And this is also why Jesus answered the question, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? By saying, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. When the prophesied perilous times come in the last days, there will be many people professing the same religion you and I profess, but because they won't love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, they will ultimately fit the descriptive warning Paul has provided. So what we need to ask ourselves when we read this prophetic warning is this. Am I now living in the perilous times of the last days? And am I avoiding the dangerous sins of these imposters that Paul described? But regardless of how you choose to answer these two important questions, please remember that Paul warned us to turn away from such people.